Wherever you travel around Great Britain, you'll quickly discover that every place you visit has its own unique ghost story to tell. Some are based on fact, some on little more than hearsay, while others are as fundamental to a district's folklore as the landscape itself. I'm Liam Dale, and I'd be very glad of your company on a ghostly trail around Britain, searching out tales of spirits past and their historical rather than hysterical origins. Naturally, being a true Cornishman, the ghost-infected foot of this sceptred isle is the best place I could think of to start. Cornwall was described by that great storyteller of English literature, Thomas Hardy, as a region of dream and mystery. And you only have to stumble across an ancient monument like the Hurlers on the outskirts of the Minions village to discover why. Dating back to about 1500 BC, high up on Bodmin Moor, the Hurlers are three stone circles in line. And although the southernmost circle is incomplete, the other two have been carefully restored. In true Celtic style, there may be a perfectly logical historical explanation for these Bronze Age standing stones, but there's also an intriguing supernatural version of events too. The idea of the stones moving or even crying out might seem fanciful, but when you hear that each one is believed to be a man turned to stone for playing the traditional ball game of hurling on a Sunday, you could be forgiven for letting your imagination run riot. Nonetheless, I've been warned not to try and count the petrified hurlers, which, legend has it, is all but impossible due to the stones having a playful tendency to move around. If I were to succeed, by all accounts, a terrible fate would befall me, though I have no idea what that actually would be. And as we're only at the very beginning of our ghostly trail around Cornwall, I think it best not to tempt fate or the spirit world just yet. For some, Cornwall is proudly regarded as a separate nation, and it certainly has its own unique character. The landscape is as beautiful as it is diverse, stretching from the wild, windswept open moors to the rugged coastline, where the sea is such an intrinsic part of Cornish heritage. Wherever you travel, you'll find ancient mysteries and monuments with all manner of hidden tales to tell. There are little-known treasures like the fascinating King's Stone, a memorial to Doniot, believed to have been the last Cornish king, while reminders of a far more famous, in fact quite legendary monarch, are to be found all over Cornwall. Stories of King Arthur delight visitors to Tintagel, and the high vantage point of the castle ruins on the cliff top overlooking the sea are truly evocative of a land of myths and legends. Journeying further south, you'll inevitably come to Land's End, which is again shrouded in the mystery of Arthurian legend. Some 30 miles out to sea lie the Isles of Scilly, which mythology claims were once joined to the Cornish mainland by the land of Leoness, home of Arthur's queen, Guinevere. Leoness was lost in a flood with the inhabitants all drowned while sleeping, and fishermen in Mounts Bay still report hearing ghostly church bells ringing on clear moonlit nights. There's no denying the air of mystery and delight that's to be found at Cornwall's most southerly point. But as well as the great natural landscape, you'll also spot plenty of man-made features. One of the most recognisable of these will be the ruins of old tin mines that in the past were responsible for sustaining so many Cornish communities. 
Working the mines was hard and dangerous, and stories of the knockers, strange ghostly prospectors who could find rich seams of tin, became part of Cornish folklore. If a miner listened carefully, he might be lucky enough to hear the knocking of the ghostly little men hammering away underground, and if he followed the sound, he'd know where to dig to make his fortune. But the knockers were easily offended, and traditionally, miners would always leave food, usually a portion of pasty or tobacco, to keep them happy. Mine accidents were often blamed on non-believers upsetting the knockers, and there are accounts of men actually being cast out from mining communities for voicing their scepticism. Perhaps I'll leave my pasty here, just to be on the safe side. The land brought forth great wealth for Cornwall, but the sea throughout the nation's history was responsible for generating untold riches. Great ships brought luxurious cargoes into the major ports. However, romantic stories of Cornish smugglers are told with gleeful relish in every fishing village. For a native Cornishman, the prospect of paying duty to the government in London on the brandy and tobacco from France that they rowed ashore was something to be avoided at all costs. Smuggling was widespread during the 18th century, and fishing villages such as Polpero, with its safe harbour and dark, narrow streets, provided the perfect destination. A visit to one of the tucked away beaches like you see here at Port Wrinkle gives you a perfect example of a smuggler's cove. The customs men had no idea how many of these sheltered coves were used to store contraband. Well known as the tales of the Cornish smugglers are, there are others of a more sinister disposition associated with the old sailing ships. Today, you'll not travel far along the cliff paths without seeing a lighthouse or a coast guard station. But in the past, sailors faced terrible danger. Legends of the old Cornish wreckers who would light fires to lure ships to go aground on the rocky shoreline are quite common. And to find out more, we'll take a short journey inland to one of the most famous haunted pubs in all Cornwall. There's no location more associated with wreckers than Jamaica Inn, made so famous by Daphne du Maurier's novel of the same name. She came across the place by accident while out riding, after getting lost when one of the moor's notorious mists came down. Seeking refuge inside, as she recovered, the local rector entertained her with ghost stories about smugglers inspiring the author to create a dark and sinister tale that still thrills to this day. Although there are many tales of wreckers, it's likely that most of them are untrue. Accounts of ships being guided to disaster on the rocks by the wreckers' lights, with passengers and crew being deliberately and brutally drowned, are often recounted but are far more likely to be embellished and exaggerated versions of genuine shipping accidents. There were undoubtedly times when ships were wrecked in storms, and many occasions when crowds of plunderers rushed to grab what they could salvage from the ship's hold. Inevitably, fights broke out and lives were lost. And reports of anguished ghostly cries where wrecks are known to lie have now become the stuff of legend. But did the plunder make its way to Jamaica Inn? Built as a coaching inn circa 1750, this was the perfect place for changing horses after the hard ride across Bodmin Moor. And from the moment you arrive in the courtyard, you definitely get a sense of stepping back in time. Extended in 1778 to include a coach house and stables, there's no doubt that contraband would have passed through here on a regular basis. And if you're wondering how the name Jamaica came about, the general consensus of opinion seems to be that smuggled rum is the probable explanation.
One of Jamaica Inn's most well-known ghost stories is that of a smuggler who's regularly seen at the bar or sat on the wall outside. Legend has it that the stranger had ordered a tankard of ale, which he proceeded to drink. Before he'd finished, he was called outside and never came back. Next morning, his body was found on the moor. He'd been attacked and robbed, very likely by fellow smugglers, and shortly afterwards, the sightings of his ghost began. As well as people seeing this apparition, many of the landlords who have been in residence over the years have reported hearing footsteps in the corridors when the pub is empty, and this wandering spirit in search of his unfinished beer is not the only ghost said to haunt Jamaica Inn. Room 5 is the site of most paranormal activity here, and it's where I'm sleeping tonight. Lucky me. The ghost of a man dressed in a sweeping cloak and tri-corner hat has appeared to many of the guests who have slept here, before, inexplicably, walking through a wall or a closed door. Suggestions are that he was a highwayman who preyed on travellers using the Bobmin to Lanston Road, stopping here at the inn to eye up possible victims. Another visitor from the spirit world that's harder to explain is the ghost of a young girl who's always weeping. There's a local story of the tragic end of a servant girl called Charlotte Dimond, who was murdered in 1844 near St. Clair, just a short distance away from Bolventa. Charlotte's distraught ghost has often been seen wandering the moors, and I can't help wondering if the crying girl who materialises in Room 5 is one and the same. There have also been sightings again in this room of a mother in great distress cradling a baby. Well, at least I now know what or whom I might encounter during the night, but for the moment this is a great opportunity just to get rid of my walking boots. <laughs> Although I'm sort of excited at the prospect of spending a night in Room 5 by myself, after all I've been told, I think that a wee drop of liquid courage before bed, best Jamaican rum of course, might not go amiss. It'll probably help me sleep straight through all the hoped for nighttime drama. Reality equals cobbles, legend equals gravel. People hear carriage wheels on gravel. And on that strange note, I'd better bid you all a very good night and see you in the morning. Hopefully. As you see, I survived my night in Jamaica Inn's notorious Room 5, and I slept very well indeed, really. The rum helped. I did wake in the early hours feeling eerily cold, which is something other guests have reported, but I didn't encounter any of the now world-famous ghosts. However, the way that the internet has allowed people from all over the globe to share their ghostly experiences at Jamaica Inn through blogs and forums makes the various uncannily similar stories seem anything but coincidence. Not so long ago, talk of a hotel being haunted would have made potential guests think twice about staying there, but today it's a very different story. Ghost enthusiasts, paranormal investigators, and the naturally curious regularly make their way to Jamaica Inn, all hoping to come face to face with spirits from the past. I'm no medium or spiritualist, of course. I'm just an interested investigator of history and a good yarn. But I do have a few thoughts about this location. When I'm not scaring myself senseless, the rational side of my brain tells me that any building as old as Jamaica Inn is going to have ghostly possibilities. 
because it's historically a meeting place of strangers, travellers and indeed the smuggling connection. The addition of mischief and foul deeds to the mix is a further catalyst for any possible paranormal activity. Crime, death and much drama will have taken place here over the centuries. Alcohol will have played its part of course and therefore what better sort of place for stories or indeed the real thing to manifest itself. Standing well off Jamaica Inn, you can get a true sense of how isolated this place would have been in times gone past. But then again, ghosts or not, how warm and welcoming must have been the flickering firelight and lamplit courtyard to the weary traveller from Truro en route via Bodmin Moor to the cities of Plymouth or beyond. My journey, just a few miles across the moor, has brought me to Dozemary Pool in search of a great Cornish ghost story. I've been given the job of emptying Dozemary Pool with a limpet shell. I'm already wondering if I'd be quicker doing it with two of them at once. The obvious question has to be why. It is, of course, an impossible task but, as you're about to discover, it's meant to be. Dozemary Pool is a very spiritual place. Long before the ghost I'm looking for appeared here, it was already a significant part of the Arthurian legend. Many people believe that this is where King Arthur's mighty sword Excalibur was finally returned to the Lady of the Lake after his last great battle. If Arthur's last stand was at Slaughter Bridge, as is suggested, only ten miles from here, the threads of the story do at least hang loosely together. However, popular claims that this lake is bottomless with a whirlpool at its centre are sadly no more than romantic fiction, which brings me neatly back to my limpet shells and the reason why Dozemary Pool was reputed to have hidden depths. Around these parts, there's a chilling supernatural tale of the most evil ghost in Cornwall, namely one Jan Tregagel. Local children would taunt each other with the threat, Tregagel will get you. And in life or death, this dark-hearted Cornishman struck terror into all who crossed his path. As a penance, his ghost was ordered to spend all eternity emptying the bottomless dozemary pool with a limpet shell. But as I've already confirmed, it was a thankless task, and I can see why it drove him screaming across the moors. Like many good ghost stories, there's fact mixed with fiction regarding Tregagel's tale. There was indeed a real Jan Tregagel who lived here at Trevorda in the 17th century, a ruthless businessman and very possibly a lawyer. Acquiring all sorts of property by dubious means, Trevanion Manor being a prime example, Tregagel nevertheless prospered and even became a magistrate. Those who stood against him found Tregagel's brand of justice brutal, and by the time he died, he was universally hated. Stories tell us that his first return as a ghost was when a defendant in a court case rashly called for him as a witness, and Tregagel demanded that those who'd summoned him save his soul from the devil's clutches. Cornish holy men intervened, and it was agreed that as long as Tregagel continuously served his penance, emptying Dozemary Pool with a limpet shell, he would be spared the fires of hell. The devil bombarded Tregagel with all that he could to stop him emptying the lake, and after a night of terrible storms, thunder and lightning, Tregagel's ghost fled with Satan's hellhounds in hot pursuit across Cornwall. But before we set off in search of Tregagel's ghost and his quest to find sanctuary, I've come to see where the real Jan Tregagel was buried and talk to local expert and historian Peter Tuttle. St. Briot Church, near Wadebridge. Jan Tregagel, bad guy or bad press? Very difficult to establish. 
Cornwall, as you've already said, was a land of legends. And as such, Jan Tregeagle became a legend with all sorts of stories woven around him. The truth and the evidence we have do not uh, confirm the fact that he was a bad man. Um, he was born at a difficult time. The Civil War broke out in England in 1642. He was a parliamentarian in Cornwall, which was very royalist, and that didn't do him any good at all. Um, he was also involved in a certain amount, and of course it also was widespread in Cornwall, witch hunts and witchcraft. And he got involved in, to, in that to a certain extent, which was a great shame for him late, later on. Um, he was also involved as a steward for the Robarts family of Lanhydrock and as a justice of the peace. Now, the justices of the peace of those, those times were usually very strict, and it always meant that somebody was going to be on the receiving end of his decisions. And that, of course, and it, and it certainly upset various people and didn't do them or him any good. Later on, of course, we've got these various legends which said he murdered his wife and his children for financial gain. He murdered an orphan for financial gain. None of that has ever been historically recorded. And so we find a man who really has nothing on his records is down as having been a very wicked man. So the truth, in my opinion, is that he was not a particularly bad man. He's actually buried in our church. That wouldn't have happened if he'd been as bad as history says. Um, the family were benefactors to the church, and I think the whole thing leads us to believe, if we're really truthful, Jan Tregeagle was not a bad man in his lifetime, but later on, all the legends stay, say that Jan Tregeagle was a very wicked man. We know that Jan Trege or John Tregeagle, the son, is buried here. We've got the tombstone, no mm -hmm. problem there at all. How do you know that Jan Tregeagle was? The county record office actually hold the records for this church and without any doubt at all, Jan Tregeagle is in those records. The only thing we don't precisely know is where in the churchyard. But the fact that they built the Tregeagle Isle um, to the south of the church, and if one looks at the dates, it could well be that he was actually buried underneath the church. And when they brought a number of memorials and gravestones into the church, um, his grave was covered over. So he could actually be beneath our church where we are at this moment. He's probably still here, really. I think he probably is, yes. I don't think he's haunting us anymore. Nor do I. With no facts to wade through, perhaps we can wallow in a bit of fiction and pull the tale of Tregagel a little harder. Legend has it that his ghost ran afar that thunderous night with the hellhounds baying for his soul. The story goes that he arrived at this place some eight miles or so from Bodmin, where at the top of a great granite outcrop he finally found a place of refuge. Roach Rock has a wild eeriness, jutting out of the green and pleasant landscape, and it'll come as no surprise that it has more than its fair share of ghost stories. The Hermitage Chapel of St Michael, built in the early 1400s at the summit, appears to emerge from the rock. It is where local legend has it that the leper Saint Gonand hid himself away to prevent his terrible disease spreading to the nearby village. Having the protection of the Cornish holyman, Tregagel believed that if he could get into the chapel, he would be safe from the hellhounds. Thrusting his head through the chapel window in his haste, eager to reach safety, Tregagel found himself well and truly stuck. With Satan's hellhounds tearing at the rest of his body, Tregagel's screams echoed around the district. In one version of the story, there was an old hermit living in the chapel, who preached night and day at Tregagel, berating him for his wicked deeds, making the ghost scream all the louder, until the locals were desperate to have him removed. Eventually, the people of Roach turned to the holy men and begged them to send Tregagel's ghost on its way. Yet again, stories differ, but one tale is of a new penance devised, and once rescued, he was dispatched to weave sand into rope for the rest of time at Padstow. Sitting quietly here in this empty chapel ruin, I certainly have a strong sense of the spiritual, and to consider staying here overnight as originally planned suddenly feels a great deal more challenging than my night at Jamaica Inn. But I've been assured that when Tregagel's ghost was moved on from Padstow, he was banished to Land's End, 
where to this day his task is to sweep up the sand that each tide brings in with it. However, I'm not convinced. If I was an errant, restless soul, destined to wander this earth for all eternity, do you know, I think Roach Rock would suit me very well. But will he make an appearance? Or is this a great example of stories woven more than sand, a tale rolled and told to keep children away from deep water, off the moors where boggy danger lurks, or indeed just to keep them all in bed at night? Who knows? Darkness will fall soon. My trail will continue.